Though the tears may fall, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. Though my heart may fail, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. While there's breath in my lungs, I will praise you, Lord. In the dead of night, I lift my eyes, I lift my eyes to you. When the waters rise, I lift my eyes, I lift my eyes to you. While there's hope in this heart, I will praise you, Lord. the rise to you God of mercy and love I will praise you Lord oh you shine with glory Lord of light I feel alive with you in your goodness now I come alive I am alive with you there is strength when I say I will praise you Lord Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance complete its work so that you may become mature and complete, not lacking anything. And he goes on to say, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. You may be seated. He amazes me, doesn't he, you, the, <laughs> the way he can do that. I, but I have to have notes. I can't do that, so I'm going to stand here at the pulpit. <laughs> I can't remember everything I'm going to say without notes. Four years ago, when our pastor had been here two years, we had a party, and we called it a four more years party. And uh, we did that on a Sunday evening after church and had a good time just fellowshipping together and celebrating the fact that we had our pastor and Debbie for another four years. They had been here two years at the time. Well, after a pastor is uh, in uh, office, or however you want to say it, for four years, then it's time for the district superintendent to come. And you heard uh, Dr. Crump last week preach to us uh, so wonderfully. And then he met with the board in the afternoon. And we had a really good time together. We had lunch, and then we had our meeting, and uh, Dr. Crump, you would have been very happy with the way he conducted everything, and uh, we were happy with it, too. You'd be happiest to know that the board gave a unanimous four-year uh, extension to Pastor and Debbie's call. <laughs> That speaks so well of our pastor and his wife, and we're proud of them and thankful for them in many, many ways. But this is the letter that I need to read to you right now. It's brief. 
On September 13, 2020, the Brazil Church Board, Pastor Marlon Betts and District Superintendent Timothy Crump spent time together reviewing the ministry of the Brazil Church of the Nazarene, our church board and pastor. We have reviewed everything that is working well and find many areas of strength as God has blessed. We believe that the church can even be a stronger participant in ministry as well as giving strong and prayerful support to our pastor, wife, and of course their family when we get a chance to do that. We rejoice in the ministry of Pastor Marlon Betts and the many strengths and gifts that God is using to build our church here in Brazil, Indiana. We, the church, Brazil Church Board, strongly and unanimously support Pastor Betts as our pastor and leader. For the days that lie ahead, we want him and Debbie to feel our support as they continue as our pastors for as long as the Lord leads. And this is signed by the district superintendent. Um, as, as your church board secretary, it's my honor to get to announce to you this this morning. Um, I got to thinking about some things about the bets, and I thought um, we have, you know, they talk about VIP people. We have VIPs in our church. Very important pastor. That's our VIP. And we have a VID, very important Debbie, because they, <laughs> the two of them are together, aren't they? They are a team, and they, we depend on them. They depend on us. This is not a one-way street in this church. We are a family and a team here that works together with the uh, help of the Holy Spirit and God's grace um, in our lives. I'd like for the bets to come, and I'm not going to ask you to stand, but if you'll come and sit right here in the front row, please, Pastor and Debbie. We have just a few little things to do here. Okay, uh, Jared, would you flash that first slide up, please, or picture? This is a, a wall in the Betts house. If you have been there, you probably have noticed the wall with the crosses on it. They're beautiful, all different kinds, and then they have more than that, I know, but those are, are the ones that Debbie has decorated the wall with. And what I thought about when I thought of that wall and those crosses is that the cross is the central part of their lives. It's the central thing in their ministry. It is what they stand for and what they've given their lives to is the cross of Jesus Christ. The... Um, pastor has been giving us messages on truth lately and they've been so good and so uh, so true <laughs> uh, to just say it again in another way and he talked to us about being not just cross wearers but cross bearers and that really struck me I wrote that down it's easy to remember but I, I thought about the crosses that I have I have several that I can wear you know one do you remember uh, Francis Lawhorn the Avon lady, I got <laughs> one of my crosses at one of her Avon sales, a, a, just a small one, but I, I love it. And then another one was a gift from a dear friend. I have um, crosses from Emmaus. If you've been on an Emmaus walk, you've got a cross. There's many different crosses, and I could put all of those on, Pastor, and hang them around my neck or wear them on my wrists or whatever it would be. But as he stressed to us, wearing is not the same as bearing the cross. And he really challenged us in that regard. And I, uh, that meant a lot to me and convicted me too. At this time, I'd like for the church board to come forward. And if you, I, you don't need to, I know we need to separate, but if you would come and sit on the front row here and just separate as you need to, the, the church board, please, would you come at this time? We get together, well, we haven't been together as much lately, have we, because of COVID and the things that have, have um, prevented it. But we are together when we can be, and we always have a good time. I've been on the board several years, and never one time have I been in a board meeting in this church where there was contention and um, fussing, you know, or anything like that. And you hear about that sometimes. 
but I'm so thankful that our pastor is organized and he leads the meeting so well and keeps us on track and we try to get him off but he won't let us you know we <laughs> he's I shall not be moved you know that song no he has a lot of fun with us too but but he is organized and well prepared for the board meetings um, Defending, I, I said something the other day, and I really mean it, about our pastor. I feel like if it ever came to the place where they told him he couldn't preach the gospel, and they came in here and tried to get him out of here, you know how they say that some, that happens in other countries. And I, I really feel so strongly that pastor would not go kicking and screaming. He would go strong and say, I'm going to stand by the gospel regardless you can take me away but I'm going to preach the gospel and I think we have a lot to be thankful for that we have a pastor that's that committed to the truth and will do whatever it takes I thought about the scripture in Romans 1 16 I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe and I firmly believe that's our pastor's commitment. Another thing I thought about was, um, I know pastor's patriotic, and we, most of us are too. And I have a shirt that says, um, I stand for the flag but kneel for the cross. You've probably seen some of those. And I, I, I believe that too. These are the things I believe about our pastor, that he believes that. He's patriotic honors our country, but he kneels only at the foot of the cross. I'd like to share something with you um, that you've probably heard this. It's the words to a song, but I thought it was so appropriate. If I can find it. Here we go. You may have heard it, but these are the words. It's not, and for this day and age, I felt like this was just bright for Pastor and Debbie. It's not conservative or liberal, however they're defined. It's not about interpretation or the judgment of the mind. It's the opposite of politics, power, or prestige. It's about a simple message and whether we believe. It's still the cross. It's still the blood of Calvary that cleanses sins and sets the captives free. It's still the name, the name of Jesus that has power to save the lost. It's still the cross. We can water down theology and preach a word to suit our needs, and we can justify sweet, noble deeds. Uh, I'm sorry, we can justify sweet, subtle lies that are wrapped in noble deeds. We can alter our convictions to adapt to social whims, but we cannot change the gospel or the truth contained within. It's still the cross, it's still the blood of Calvary that cleanses sins and sets the captives free. It's still the name, the name of Jesus, that has power to save the lost. It's still the cross. And thank you, Pastor, for keeping that in front of us every Sunday when you uh, are in the pulpit speaking to us. All right, at this time, <clears throat> I would like for um, you to everybody to stand, please. And Debbie and Pastor, would you come and stand uh, up in front and you can face the people if you would and the board come and stand along with them uh, as close as you dare be I know we have to be so careful and I don't want to change that but well I do want to change it but they won't let me so I mean the country won't let me um, yes thank you very much we, all of our board members are not here we're missing where is Paul back there somewhere yeah okay all right Jared's in the booth. <laughs> well, their hearts are up here, I believe. They're, I know they are. They're with us. And uh, I want us to pray for them. And I'm going to ask if you would please, uh, I would like for the men who pray on Saturdays with Pastor also to come up. And if you have ever joined Pastor in that Saturday prayer group, would you come up and just stand where you can up here with, with Pastor? And the ladies in the, in the Tuesday prayer group that pray, uh, and Debbie comes when she can to that group, and but we pray for them, and we'd like for them to, you ladies, if you would, come and stand with us here, too, if any of you would care to do that. 
we'd be so glad for you too. Madeline and Mike Sparks have been pastors, uh, oh my, how many years did you pastor Madeline? Do you know how long it was? Over 20, okay. Uh, are you free to come and stand with Mike or is that a problem? Okay, thank you. Some of us are limping these days. <laughs> We have is issues, don't we all, one thing or another, but I didn't want to put her out to do this. But I'm going to ask Mike if he will uh, pray for a pastor in particular, and then Madeline if she will pray for Debbie. And if you all w would care to just step out into the aisles and come as close as you can, just step into the aisles, and you don't have to come all the way up, but let's just bring ourselves into a... a feeling of oneness here today and appreciation uh, for our pastor and Debbie. Mike, I'm going to give you the mic. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you with grateful hearts. We acknowledge, Lord Jesus, in times like these that we need a Savior. In times like these, we need a leader. And our Father, we are very fortunate this morning to have Pastor Betts to be our pastor and leader. And so, Lord, as we pause for these moments, we would ask a divine touch of God once again to come on our pastor. We are so thankful. Lord Jesus, we love you today. We love our pastor. And, Lord, we're asking that in times like these, you would be so near. We thank you again. We've said it more than once in our prayer. But Lord, we thank you for our pastor and his dedicated, wonderful wife. Lord, we ask that you would be so near to them that they could sense Almost have to reach out and touch you, Lord Jesus. You're so close. So with all of this, once again, our congregation wants to give you honor and give you thanks. And at the same time, thank our pastor and his beloved wife. And we ask all of these things in the wonderful, precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come to you again this morning. And Lord, we just pray that your special blessing will be down upon Debbie, realizing that pastoring a church is not the easiest thing, and being a pastor's wife, is not easy as well but lord she has been such, had such a good spirit and been so jovial and uplifting we pray father that you will just touch her and anything that she has to endure uh, with the ministry or on her job as well lord we pray that you will bless her she'll you'll lift her up and help her to continue with her positive attitude and lord just fill her each day with your holy spirit we pray, Lord, for Debbie just now, and we pray for their, their girls as well. We pray, Father, that you'll just bless this family, bless them, and help them to draw so near to you, and listen to your voice, and walk in your ways. Amen. In, in keeping with us, see, Ian, would you come and take out what's in that bag, please? Along with the card, take out what's in that bag. <laughs> take out what's in the bag. In keeping with the uh, thinking about the cross, we wanted to get something to 
for our pastor and Debbie to remember us by today and remember this day when we're so glad for four more years. Let's say it together. Four more years. We can't party, but we can say it <laughs> and mean it. Uh, um, just hand that to them, if you would, along with the card. And there's going to be a picture so you can see it better up on the... Um, it's actually an afghan or a wall hanging or whatever. You open it up if you want to, Debbie. But it has a cross with the flowers around the cross, and it says, I can do all things through Christ. Is it upside down? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we hope that will fit in with your decor and your home and that you can throw that over your... Yeah, there you go. <laughs> we didn't know it was going to be so versatile. Now you can, you can even wear it. <laughs> We're going to sing together just a cappella. I think, Pastor, am I correct that when you sang at your mother's memorial service, you sang near the cross? Was that what you sang? You, well, I can see why you wouldn't remember. But anyway, some, several of us were there that day, and I believe that's the song he sang. So we're going to sing just a verse and a chorus together in honor of them and their commitment to the cross and to our congregation. Jesus, keep me near the cross, there a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream, flows from as we close this. We are one in the bond of love. We are one in
Lord, we give you the glory and the honor this morning. We thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you for the good weather and um, being able to just come here and worship you with our voices. Help us not just to sing songs this morning, but to take these words and just apply them to our heart and to sing them with purpose to you. We love you. You may be seated. Waymaker, one more time. 
pastor is only as good as, uh, as his God, but also only as good as his helpers. And there's so many ministries in this church that happen that people just take for granted that they're happening. And I really appreciate that. From nursery, we worship children's church and Thursday nights and uh, with teens and uh, David's Wednesday night Bible study and the teen quizzing and I think they meet on Wednesdays, and I mean, there are just so many things that keep going. There's a bus ministry, there's a closed closet ministry, there's been a lot of work going on, and we'll probably soon be starting up our breakfast ministry. <laughs> I mean, this is, this, is, this is the church, and uh, they make me look good like I, well, I'm a good leader, but we have prayer groups that are meeting. I don't have to worry about it. It just happens. And I, I appreciate that because all of us are part of the body of Christ. And if you're praying, you're helping. If you're making phone calls and encouraging, you're helping. If you're sending a letter, if you're cooking food, whatever it is that you have as a ministry, the body of Christ is working. And the praise team is doing an excellent job. And, you know, we don't have to worry about it. It just happens, right? But they work at it. These are the things that make it all part of who we are as the body of Christ. And a uh, pastor can't do it, but the lawn gets mowed and all the things get done. Our safety team, it, it, it's just awesome when you begin to think about everything that keeps happening every week. And I just wanted to say thank you. And uh, when the district superintendent comes, you know, he sees a few things, but there is a lot that goes on. And, uh, of course, there's a, a lady that works in the office, too. Probably should say something about her. But <laughs> I almost got a grin out of her. There we go. She keeps me in line sometimes. John chapter 14 and John chapter 16, uh, we've, we've been in there. That's with the spirit of truth. The helper is coming, and we've spent some time on that. I want to look at two verses this morning. As you stand, they'll be on the screen. John 14, 27, John 16, 33. And I'll share in a minute why I'm choosing these. But you'll, you'll put it together. John 14, 27, words of Jesus. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Chapter 16, verse 33. Words of Jesus, as he's finishing up these words of final admonition. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And then they go to the garden and he prays the, the prayer. John 17. 
Thank you, Lord, for the words of Jesus again today. Encourage us by them, we pray, but more than that, just strengthen us and, and enable us. We want to be your servants and we want to do the best we can. And Lord, you've promised us peace. Thank you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. A lot has happened this week, much of which overshadowed perhaps the most important thing that happened this week, and that was that four world leaders got together at the White House, and three of them who have been in conflict signed a peace agreement. Israel was one of those. It didn't get a whole lot of press, it didn't get a whole, but to tell you the truth, it was a pretty big moment. When Arab countries and Israel can sign a peace agreement, it's a big deal. And it put Iran on notice and some other countries on notice. I know the Bible says the people say peace, but there is no peace, but it still is a big pretty big deal, and I don't know how long term or what will happen, but I just wanted to point that out to you. While peace agreement was signed this week, conflict seems to be the environment in which we live, and that is why it did not get much press. We would rather push the conflict narrative in the news than a peace narrative. And sometimes we get the idea in life, or we used to anyway, I don't know if we're there right now, but that life for most Christians is calm and quiet. (laughs) And that has probably never been true. The history of Christianity has always been about struggle. In America, we've had it easy for a few years. But soldier language is frequently used in the Bible. I didn't even think in the Old Testament when, when David is writing the Psalms, he talks about God being his fortress and his high tower and a place he runs to hide. And he was being chased all over the place. And it goes on into even the New Testament, soldier language being used by Paul. And what they're trying to remind us throughout the whole Bible is that Satan is the enemy, God's kingdom is at stake, and we must fight. And we will ultimately win. That's the words of Scripture. And in this Gospel of John, three chapters, 14, 15, and 16, comprise Jesus' final words to his disciples before he prayed in the garden for them and and us, and then went on to the trial and the cross. I mean, these are his final words, and that's where I've been sticking for, uh, in my mind, for a couple of weeks here. And um, there are important topics Jesus shared with them as he was leaving them. He starts out with, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Remember those wonderful words? And and then he he shared, uh, I am the vine, and you are the branches. There's some good teaching here. There's some others. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I mean, and he then told them in a section that he said, you will be persecuted. He keeps warning them, I'm going to my Father. But when I go, I'm going to send the Spirit, the Helper, the Spirit of Truth, the Paraclete. He's going to come alongside of you. He's going to guide you. He's going to help you. He's going to bring to remembrance the things that I've told you. And guide you into all truth and all those kind of things. And in the two verses we read this morning, Jesus used the word peace. Now since this was not a usual teaching word of Jesus, it has special meaning in this setting as he's getting ready to die, as he's getting ready to go. He's finishing up his work. And I wanted to share that significance of the use of the word peace with you today. Because Jesus left his disciples and, and, and so... He leaves to us a legacy of peace. Two questions. I just noticed this morning that I didn't underline a word, so Debbie did not give you a blank to put in (laughs) in this morning. But you can certainly write underneath it. Uh, The first question is, what does it mean to have peace? 
What does it mean to have peace? What's Jesus talking about? Now, many of you already know that the word peace, it's Greek here, but it comes from Jesus talking and other Jewish people would have been talking in Hebrew, and the word is what? Shalom. A Hebrew shalom. And it's used frequently in the Jewish life. Peace, shalom, was their common hello and goodbye. They would say that when they would greet each other as Jewish citizens. It's their hello and goodbye word. It probably was so common that most people said it with, without thinking. Kind of like when we walk up to a person and say, hey, how you doing? We don't really want an answer. It's just something we say. You know, it's just a greet. And maybe that's how shalom got to be with them. It was just, you know, hey, shalom, uh, how's your wife doing? Or, you know, whatever, transaction, you got any sheep for sale? Or whatever that they went, on. shalom was just their way of hello, goodbye, greeting. And it may have become commonplace to them. But shalom as a greeting really meant more it, uh, behind that greeting is a powerful meaning, something like, uh, may you have wholeness and well-being. Not just peace, uh, but wholeness. Um, idea of everything going good in your life. Well-being, well-rounded, good stuff happens to you. It's kind of like you, uh, when you're leaving somebody, sometimes you may use the word uh, as a Christian, God bless you. May all of God's blessings come into your life. May things in your life go good because you are in a right relationship with God. That's kind of what it means, you know, wholeness and blessing and goodness and, and God's best for you. Now, there are a couple of occasions when the Gospels actually record Jesus walking into a room uh, as a post-resurrection appearance, and he may say to them, peace, peace. Be unto you, kind of the first words, shalom to you, you know, out of his mouth because they're scared, they're locked in, they're whatever the case may be. So he may have actually used this as a greeting, probably he did all the time when he was hanging out, when he would meet people, maybe that was something that he would say. But here, it's not real common in the scriptures for Jesus to use peace as a word that he teaches about. That is why I think he used, his use of peace in, is significant in this setting where he's giving his final words to Jesus. Remember, that's what this is about. He's going to the prayer in the garden, his trial through the night hours, his crucifixion the next day, and yet he uses the word peace. You don't find him teaching on peace very often. So here Jesus is using the word peace Obviously, for his way of saying goodbye to his disciples, and they would have got that significance because he says, you're going to be persecuted, and I'm going to my Father, and I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and all these kind of things. Peace be to you. Peace be with you. My peace I give to you. So he is trying to say, God be with you, my disciples, because my work on earth is, is finished, and I am going away, and I want you to know that you can have my peace. Peace is also Jesus' way of leaving a legacy. I'm going away, but I'm going to leave you my peace. A sense of well-being, a sense of wholeness, God's blessing on your life. It's going to be here even after I am gone. You're going to have some tough times. In this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. You know. But I promise you, you're going to make it through them because I'm giving you my peace, my help, my wholeness. Your well-being is going to be taken care of. So we read this verse, chapter 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. In this verse, Jesus said that his peace was not the same of that which the world gives. Not as the world gives. No, it's different. My peace I give to you. 
Now, the world understood peace as the absence of conflict. A lot of people would say, well, peace agreement, you know, they're not going to be in conflict anymore, those kind of things. So that would be a, a concept. And the Romans had what they called the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. But when the Romans gave you peace, it was because what? They had conquered your country, and they stationed troops in your country, just like they did in, in Jerusalem and the, some of the surrounding, wherever there was, there was governors, and they had soldiers, and they had people that they could call on, and if there was an uprising, they came out with arms, and they took you out. That's Roman peace. Peace under authority and under oppression, and under occupation. Now there's Greek philosophers, and they said, know yourself, and all this. They talk about peace as a uh, teaching how to, knowing yourself will produce inner calmness and tra tranquility. If you really get to know who you are, then, then you will be peaceful. All of this is going on. But neither of these is the kind of peace that Jesus is talking about and he's offering and he's giving to his disciples. The context of these three chapters includes rejection by the world, persecution. Jesus told them in uh, verse, uh, chapter 16, verse 32, uh, kind of interesting, right before he talks about his peace, he, he uses the word, you will be scattered. Indeed, the hour is coming and now has come that you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone, and yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. I mean, the context is right there. It's not a peaceful life. And then he says, in this world you will have tribulation. I mean, he continues that thought there. So it's not a peace that talks about Everything perfect in your life. There will be rejection of Christians, Jesus is telling them. So Jesus is definitely not talking about outward peace. Between people and nations and uh, Christians and non-Christians and, and countries and, and whatever. He's not talking about that kind of peace. He is teaching them about the inner peace that a Christian has down inside, even when the world is in chaos all around you. And we're living in a world of chaos. But what does the Christian have? There's a peace in my heart that the world never gave. A peace it cannot take away. Though the trials of life may surround like a cloud, I have a peace that has come here to stay. There's a deep, settled peace in my soul. There's a deep, settled peace in my soul. What Jesus has offered and what Christians have experienced ever since is that while troubles swirl outside of our bodies and outside of our homes and outside of our churches, there is inner confidence in God that it clearly states, it's okay, I am God, I am with you, I love you, I will help you, you are going to get through this, you will be victorious because I am God. We struggle today with this. As we talked in the Sunday school class, the celebration is going Many of the Christians are not celebrating today. We don't think, we, we are depressed, we're discouraged, we're down. Why? Because of all this junk that we hear about constantly, 24 7, and it's depressing news. But that's outside. What about inside? What do we have? What does it mean to have peace? What is the peace Jesus is talking about? There's a deep, settled peace in my soul. 
There's a deep settled peace in my soul, though the billows of sin near me roll. Where's it come from? He abides. Christ abides. What does it mean to have peace? Constantly abiding. Jesus is mine. We sing these songs. But it's a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why they don't have peace. But that's why you have peace. And we need to tap into it, ladies and gentlemen. Because Jesus is offering it. We think, well, the disciples had it easy. He was leaving them. They saw him die on the cross. They all forsook him and fled. It was not easy. But Jesus stepped back into the room. Here's my hand. Here's my side. Peace. I give to you. So how do Christians experience this peace? I'm so glad you asked. Two things. And you know these. Let me remind you of them. First, we receive peace through Christ's victory on the cross. Verse 16, chapter 16, verse 33. Jesus said, last words before they leave, at least in John's gospel, and go to the garden. He said, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. <laughs> Some of you were almost excited. <laughs> See, peace and trouble come together. You don't need peace unless there's trouble. In this world, you will have tribulation. If everything's going smooth, you're not going to be asking God for inner peace. If everything in the world around you, but guess what? It's not that way because the world does not follow Jesus Christ. But in me, I give you peace. In this world, you will have tribulation. But be of a big smile. may not sit on your face, but you feel it in your heart. Because Jesus has overcome the world. Peace and trouble go together, but in Jesus we can have inner peace even while the tribulation, even while the trouble is going on around us. Why? Why can we have that peace when it's all mess? Because we have a present realization that Jesus has already defeated Satan. He has already died for our sin. He has taken it away. He's preparing a home for us in heaven. He sent us the Holy Spirit. He is going to take care of you. And he's overcome the world. The whole system has already been won by Jesus on the cross. The Greek word for overcome comes from the Greek root, Nike, which means victory. I hate it when they take our good Christian words Victory is the root behind this word overcome. In this world, you will have tribulation. I'm giving you peace. In this world, you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer because I give you victory. Already won victory. It seems ironic initially because Jesus was nailed to the cross. It appeared he was defeated by the world. It, it looked like they won. It looked like it was over. Satan is gloating. Everything is going good. 
for the world. But his death on the cross turned everything upside down because everything that looked bad, looked like he was defeated, looked like he was gone, was turned around because his blood became our salvation. His death became our way of getting out of this and escaping the world. And his way of resurrecting became our resurrection to new life. We were buried with him and we rise again to new life through Jesus Christ. And when we follow Jesus to the cross and we kneel there and confess our sins and accept his salvation, our earthly and eternal victory is assured. COVID can take lives, but it can't take away the victory of Jesus Christ. Hurricanes can flood our country, but they cannot take away the victory. They can destroy things, wildfires, whatever it is, is destroying property. But nothing can destroy the victory we have in Jesus A president and a vice president can argue back and forth for the next, how many days, 50 days? And they're going to go back and forth and on and on and point their fingers and carry on. But it's not about their victory. It's about Christ's victory. And no matter who wins, you better have something in here. Because there's a deep, settled peace in my soul. I remember I was in seminary years ago. Woo. When somebody got reelected as president and all the Christians of the seminary were down and defeated. <laughs> what are we going to do? And an old professor, Dr. Taylor, he's gone now. Do you remember Nazarene professor Richard S. Taylor? stood in front of our class and said, people have been elected before that were not Christians and did not believe our ways. God's still on the throne. It's going to be okay. And you know we made it. You see, our hope is not built on Mr. Trump or Mr. Biden or Mitch McConnell, or Nancy Pelosi, or Chuck Schumer, or McCarthy, is that his name? Yeah. All these, or Supreme Court Justice, or anything else, because they don't control Jesus Christ, and they can't stop the words from a cross, and they can't stop what the cross has done for us in our lives. Uh, You still better vote. And you still better pray. God expects us to do our part. But when we come to Jesus and kneel there and confess our sins and accept his salvation, our earthly and eternal victory is assured. COVID can take lies. It cannot take away Christ's victory. Hurricanes and fires can destroy possessions, but they cannot take away Christ's victories. I know I said that, but I want to repeat that. Because Christians down through the years have faced all kinds of persecutions and problems and terrible situations, a whole lot worse than what we've gone through as far as in their personal lives and their family. I mean, Richard Wormbrandt, you just, how many years in prison, his wife was killed and his son right in front of him, I believe, on and on it goes, this is not unusual for Christians to face all kinds of issues. But remember, that's outside. They may take your life, but they can't take away Jesus. They can't take away your victory. Everyone, through all these years of persecution, who stuck with Jesus has the assurance of his victory, and this always gave them inner peace. His victory gives us the peace. So how do we experience this peace? First, through Christ's victory on the cross. But there's a second. (laughs) That's in our chapter 14 passage. I read you verse 27 about his peace, but did you read 26 with it to get the context? 
Verse 25 says, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give you. Uh, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. He has just talked about the Spirit. So we, we are able to experience peace through Christ's victory on the cross, but secondly, through the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Amen. Jesus died on the cross to give us the victory over Satan, sin, and temptation. But there is more because Jesus went away, but he sent us the helper, his, Jesus' presence inside of us to consistently and constantly offer us the peace of Jesus. How do we experience the peace? Through the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And when we get down or depressed or discouraged or even defeated, it looks like there's no way out. There is a spirit of truth down inside us. Do you know that? There is still a spirit of truth inside you. And that quiet voice reminds us, Barb, look to Jesus. Mary Sue, pray to Jesus. Ian, look up. Look to Jesus. Think about Jesus. He already won. You have the victory. You are victorious through Christ. He loves you. Seek God for your help right now at this moment in time. Pat and Paul, look to Jesus. There's a voice. Because he knows if he can get you focused on Jesus, the victor, and remind you that the battle has already been won, that Jesus is already victorious, that your future is assured, and you will get through this. And the moment you and I say that word, Jesus, the moment we get our eyes off of the problem and get our eyes on our Savior, the moment we say, Jesus, you know how fast God can come? Well, that didn't happen to me that way. When I was in my dumps of despair, I said, Jesus. <laughs> and I didn't feel a thing. You got to say Jesus with some hope behind it. You got to say some Jesus with a little joy behind it, a little peace behind it, a little love behind it. You got to say Jesus with a little confidence because you know who he is. He's Nike. And not no swish, it's a cross, Nike. It's a victory. Oh, victory in Jesus. Start singing that next time the devil comes around. See how long he sticks. Because the moment we say Jesus, something happens. We receive a blood transfusion of spiritual power and energy and love and care. And there is a God and he knows about me. You ever had a blood transfusion? I've seen it happen many times. Now, they take blood from me, but some people get it. And when it comes, you can see the color come back. You can see them change. You can see energy. You can see all kind of stuff. What is, God gives us a spiritual blood transfusion. He lets us know it's going to be okay. I am here. It's all right. I'll take you home or I'll fill up your problem and, and solve it right now. Or even if I don't take the problem away, I will give you something inside that's stronger than the pressure outside. My peace. And 
Spiritual power and his peace begins to flow through our veins. Our encourager goes to work. Our strengthener gets us back on our feet. Our comforter says, you are victorious through Christ. The comforter has come. The comforter has come. You begin to quote scripture. You start to pray. You better have some scriptures in your mind. You better have a connection in prayer. And then when you begin to quote scripture and pray, you remember a song and you begin to sing that song. A praise. And the darkness is pushed back once again through the power of what? Your faith in a God who sent Jesus, who loves you. And that faith in Jesus because he is the way, the truth and the life. And that is how Christians experience Christ's legacy of peace. Jesus' victory on the cross and the Holy Spirit living inside. Jesus didn't say it's going to be easy. He said in this world you're going to have tribulation. He's not telling his disciples everything's easy. He tells them you're going to be scattered in just a few minutes. You're going to be running It's not going to be easy, but my peace I give to you. And it made a difference. Because how were the disciples after Pentecost? They weren't running. Every one of them stood and died for Jesus Christ. Now, isn't it interesting that when Jesus was born... The angel showed up to the shepherds and sang a song. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace. Goodwill to all men. Peace. As he was entering the world. What does Jesus say as he's leaving the world? Peace. I give to you. Peace, I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. This is the divine legacy of Jesus. He has bestowed a special treasure upon us as his heirs. He could have given us gold or more pleasure or entertainment or even fame or power, but those things would have been temporary. He gave us something better, something that is permanent. It will satisfy you whether you're rich or poor, whether you're famous or nobody. It doesn't matter. You have something from Jesus. Something permanent. A legacy of peace. There's a deep, subtle peace in my soul. He gives us the peace of sins forgiven, it's not there anymore. It's gone. Jesus took it away. Sin is gone. He gives us the peace of fellowship with God. Hey, God, you and me, right? This is a tough day, but you and I, there's nothing that'll happen today that you and I can't handle together. And he gives us, when that time comes, the peace of eternal life. Because we know no matter what they do to us, They can't separate us from the love of God. They can't. And his peace is enough. He abides. And we will overcome. Family altar time. I just wish a bunch of you old saints and a bunch of you young saints 
new Christians, old Christians, it didn't matter, would just come in these front seats and around the altar and just say, thank you, God, for peace. Isn't it time we celebrate? Maybe we just need to, instead of complaining to God, just do some prayer time where we actually say thank you. I don't like the world. You're making a mess of it. God, you're doing a terrible job right now. Ah, he's probably heard all the grumps that he wants to hear from, from Christians in America for a while. He would kind of like us to say, hey, God, I love you. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for this deep, settled peace in my heart. Thank you that no matter what's going on in the world around me, I know that you are God and you died for me and it's going to be okay because you said you're preparing a place for me. And... You told Satan, get behind me. And you told Satan, it's time for you to just get out of here. And you told Satan, you defeated already. That's what Jesus did. He is overcome victory over Satan. That's Jesus. He's overcome the world. So as we stand together, the praise team comes and sings. I don't even know what they're singing, but that's okay. Why don't you come forward and just tell Jesus, I love you. Would that be all right? Now, if you're struggling a little bit with some of this peace, you can come forward and pray about it. That's okay, too. But let's just, let's just allow God to feel our love and our thanks and our appreciation this morning. Is that okay? Uh, come on, church. Worship God. He deserves it. Six.
troubling you and taking away your peace. This may be a little kindergartenish in a way, but it's okay. And that is if you take your hands right now and turn them palm size down so that your palms are facing down. And, and if you would just in your mind, drop that stuff, <laughs> whatever it is, name it and drop it. Lord, I don't like what's going on in the world. I don't like what's going on in my life. I don't like this cancer. I don't like this whatever it is. And I don't like what the doctor said. Or I don't like what my family said. Or I don't like what the politician said. Or whatever. If, if you can just take that and just drop it. Shake your hands a little bit. <laughs> Let it go. Quit letting it cling on to you. Because whatever it is. I don't like this COVID mess. I don't like. Lord, here it is. Drop it. I release it. I release it to you, God. I let it go. I can't do anything about it anyway except worry and stew, and that's not helping. But, Lord, I just release it to you today, and then I'm going to turn my palms right side up to you. And I'm going to ask you, Lord Jesus, please come and fill me with your peace and with your hope and with your joy and with your love and with your presence and with your help. Oh God, I release this to accept you, but I cannot accept you if I keep holding on to the things that are tearing me down. So Lord, today I just surrender those things and I turn my hands up to you in an attitude of come and fill me. Come Lord and sweep into me and come Lord and fill me up with your presence so that I know it is well with my soul. Regardless of what's going on out there. Because when peace like a river or when sorrows like sea billows whatever my life Jesus, you have taught me to say, it is well with my soul. And Lord, that's where we need to be today. In this world, you will have trouble, but be of good cheer, because I have overcome the world. And so, Lord, thank you for reminding us of your legacy of peace today. Accept it, we accept it, and we say thanks. <laughs> and we rise and return to our worship time by singing the chorus. It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. Yeah. 
Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. And we say, Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. Have a good week, everybody.